Hey there, James and Jazz here, and thank you guys so much for joining us for today's video. We are not quite in the next series of Bible study with us. We're gearing up for Galatians, yep. but we're doing a video that is kind of Bible study with us because it is Psalm 91, yep. but it's also a special topical video. So yep. we are going to dive in not to downplay COVID, but to just show how much greater the power of Jesus is, God's protection over us, yeah. and how we are sheltered under the shadow of his wings from all plagues, including COVID. Yeah. So I say all that because this is so applicable to what is going on in today's society, and mm -hmm. we thought that it would be beneficial to do a special study on Psalm 91 if you haven't read Psalm 91 for yourself, please pause this video and read it. That way you can get everything out of it that the Holy Spirit's wanting to teach you before you hear what we have to say. Um, but we're excited to dive in. I'm going to be reading out of the Living Bible and the Christian Standard Bible. And James is going to be reading the NIV translation. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. We're not going to waste too much time. We're going to get right back into the study. Yeah. Yeah. And when we start talking about new books, the Bible, uh, if it's not obvious, we like to talk about who perhaps authored that book. It's always nice to know who wrote you a letter, right? Who wrote, who wrote this letter? I mean, we do know, uh, most importantly, that all Scripture is God-breathed and uh, helpful, useful in uh, teaching, rebuking, correcting, all of that good stuff. So it's important to know all scripture is God breathed. And as a believer, um, I believe that that is the truth. Amen. So that's most important. It's not to me, it's really not that important who the author is. Cause I believe that the true author is God and he spoke to and through somebody to write what is written. Basically, um, which vessel, yeah, which person did which, God choose? Which vessel was used? Exactly. Yeah. So, um, but uh, so I do want to quickly talk about this. Um, many commentators say that Psalm 91 was written by Moses. Most of the time when you hear song, like a psalm, you're like, oh, it's probably by David. Well, the thing is, most psalms that psalm book, of, most chapters that David has written will say a psalm of David for the most part. It's usually his stuff is usually labeled really well. If it's not labeled, there's a few things that, that people look at. So they believe that Moses, a lot of commentators believe Moses wrote Psalm 91 because one, it's not labeled, and two, Moses wrote Psalm 90. So usually they'll look to what author was in the most recent book before that psalm. So in this case, they look back to Psalm 90, it was Moses. Um, another reason um, it is, uh, oh, another reason is that, sorry, Psalm 9114 in the King James Version uses the phrase, set his love upon me. And Deuteronomy 7, 7 of the King James Version authored by Moses says, set his love upon you. So when commentators or when similar phrases and styles of writing are used, it helps commentators to try to identify the authors of un unidentified books or chapters of the Bible. So uses very similar phrase there that probably nobody else really used. I, I don't, don't hear a lot of people say set his love upon or set his love, you know, whatever. It's pretty rare, I would say. Specific yeah, to that specific. individual's vocabulary. Yeah. So... If it is not, however, uh, it is not, however, 100% sure that this chapter was written by Moses, but from the two things I mentioned, it seems highly likely that Moses did indeed write this chapter. So, as I said before, what's most important is we know that the true author of the Bible is God. He speaks to and through people to uh, individuals to write his word. So, um, yeah. All right, verse 1. We live within the shadow of the Almighty, sheltered by the God who is above all gods. Okay, so this implies being very close to God. That is going to be a central theme that we mm -hmm. focus on heavily. But when you live within the shadow of the Almighty, you think about, okay, well, a shadow, you have to be very close to an individual if you're going to be in their mm -hmm. shadow. Yep. If I'm going to try to be in James's shadow, I have to be like right up next to him or right up behind him, you know? Mm -hmm. 
So this implies being very close to God. You can't be in someone's shadow unless you're close to them. And yes, this chapter gets inferred about physical safety. Psalm 91, people think about physical safety. But this is also talking about spiritual safety. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure we're going to talk about a lot here in this video that when you are close to God, when you're serving God, when you are obeying God, you're under the umbrella of protection that God provides because you are living your life in obedience to his word. And he puts the word in place so that harm doesn't come to us. No. So the Christian Standard Bible reads like this for verse 1. The one who lives under the protection of the Most High dwells in the shadow of the Almighty. So that translation shows it's very specific to who receives this protection. It says, the one who lives under the protection of the Most High dwells in the shadow. So we know that you have to be consistently in the shadow of the Most High, mm -hmm. meaning this is where you're staying put consistently. You are fixed. This doesn't mean you're running in and out of the shadow of the Most High. It's like, I dwell in the shadow of the Almighty. Like that word dwell just has the connotation of I'm staying put, like my roots are down deep. And I'm not like going here and there and half in to God, half in the world, like straddling the fence. Like, no, it's saying you're dwelling in the shadow of the Most High. You are in his shadow. Like, mm -hmm. so that's what I got from verse one. <clears throat> awesome. So my verse one says, he who dwells in this NIV, he, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I don't know if that was, it was yeah, pretty, pretty similar. similar. Um, so... I have a lot to say on this, so please bear with me. Uh, take notes, whatever you got to do. I've got like quite a few, a few pages on this one. So this verse is super important as it is the setup. In my opinion, this is the setup for the whole chapter. I see it as an if this, then that kind of sentence. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High God, so that's the if, then will refer to the rest of this chapter. So, and we're also going to see that in, in verse uh, nine, I believe it is, that it actually does have an if. So it's kind of an if then this. Um, so you're, you first have to choose to dwell in the shelter of the most high, then you will rest in the shadow of the almighty. Then the rest of the verses in this chapter apply to you as well. So it seems pretty simple, right? All you have to do is kick back and dwell in the shelter of God and all the rest of, and, and, and then you just get to rest and get the great protection uh, that's available to you, right? Seems pretty simple. Um, let's think about this scripture a bit more deeply and compare it to our lives here on earth. I always like to do that. How does this apply to my life? How can I put myself in the shoes of this situation? When I lived with my parents, they put me, uh, they put a roof over my head, bought me clothing that I needed, made sure I was well fed, made sure I got a good education, school, church, etc. And they gave me as much opportunity as they possibly could. They sacrificed a lot so I would have more opportunity. However, since I lived under my parents' roof, they expected me to respect them and obey any rules that they put into place. With that in mind, let's take a look at verse 1 again. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High, I believe that we are able to dwell in the shelter of the Most High when we are obedient to the rules that the Lord has set for us. I think Jazz mentioned a little bit about that as well. I look at, I look at it like this. When we choose to be disobedient, we are stepping outside of God's hedge of protection and in those times of disobedience, we are fair game for the enemy to devour, as we read in 1 Peter 5, 8. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. When you are obedient and, a and able to dwell under the shelter of the Most High, the enemy doesn't have the slightest chance to devour you. Another simpler way to look at it at this is when you're obedient, this is kind of what Jazz said, it's like you are under this umbrella, which protects you from getting wet by the rain. 
When you're walking in disobedience, you have made a choice to step outside of that umbrella of protection and get soaked by the rain. That being said, let's choose to be obedient and stay under God's umbrella of protection so we can grow closer to Him and enjoy the rest and protection that is mentioned throughout the rest of Psalm 91. So, some more thoughts on verse 1. When I started looking at this verse as an if this, then that, and also you'll see later in verse 9 as I talked about, it reminded me of Deuteronomy 28. So, I'll quickly read verses 1 through 14. If you fully obey, so there's an if, if you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands I give all all his commands I give to you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. If again, you will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed in the crops of your land and the young of your livestock. The calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks, your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. You will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. Talks a lot about that in Psalm 91. They will come at you from one direction, but flee from you in seven. The Lord will Send a blessing on your barns and on everything you put your hands to. The Lord will, your God will bless you in the land he is giving you. The Lord will establish you as his holy people, as he promised you on oath. If you keep the commands of the Lord, your God, and walk in obedience to him, then all the peoples on earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord and they will fear you. The Lord will grant you abundant prosperity in the fruit of your womb, the the young of your livestock, and the crops of your ground, in the land he swore to your ancestors to give you. The Lord will open the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty, all uh, uh, of his bounty to send rain on your land in season, and he will bless all the works of your hands. You will lend to many nations, but borrow from none. The Lord will make you the head, not the tail. If you pay attention to the commands of the Lord, your God, that I give you this day and carefully follow them, you will always be on the top and never at the bottom. Do not turn aside from any of the commands I give to you today, to the right or to the left, follow, uh, following other gods and serving them. All... All Which of that. chapter is that? That is Deuteronomy 28, verses okay. 1 through 14. I think so, you said Psalm 28 earlier. Oh, sorry. So I wanted to clarify. So Deuteronomy 28. Um, so anyways, all of that stuff uh, in those 14 verses, those first 14 verses of Deuteron- Deuteronomy 28, they apply to you as well. I believe they apply to all of us. So if you fully obey the Lord, your God, and carefully follow all his commands, is an if this, then that. If you read the rest of Deuteronomy 28, it mentions the curses for disobedience, which is basically the opposite and more of all that I mentioned in verses 1 through 14. So I just wanted to use that as an example of if if this, then that. And it's more specific when you read Psalm 91, 9. Um, And then the final thing I want to say on this, just one more paragraph here, bear with me. The final section of scripture that came to mind as a result of study in verse 1 is Psalm 119, 1 through 3. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. So we're overly blessed in so many ways when we walk in the Lord's ways and take shelter in him. So my attitude is... We're welcome to take shelter under the Lord, under his wings, everything that says while we're in disobedience or while we're in obedience, sorry. But so that's open for us while we're in obedience. But when we choose to be in disobedience, we're stepping outside of that shelter. We're stepping outside of that hedge of protection, outside of that umbrella. So that's the whole reason that I really wanted to read Deuteronomy 28, Mm -hmm. because that suggests that there's an if this. So if I... If I'm in obedience, these things are for me, and this shelter is for me. 
But when I step outside, that's a choice that I make to walk in disobedience and do things that are not the Lord's ways, the ways of the world. And now I'm no longer necessarily covered by Psalm 91 or, right. or uh, blessed with what's in Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14. Then it goes on to the other side of things, which go ahead and read the rest of Deuteronomy 28. And it's, it's pretty, I didn't even want to bother with that. So you're going you're gonna to know which side you want. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> You Sorry it took so long, but I had a lot to say on that one. No, it's good. It's real good. Uh, verse 2, moving along. It says, This I declare, that he alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I am trusting him. The Christian Standard Bible says he's your fortress. So that's really what I want to hone in here. Mm. But first of all, this I declare. That's the first a positive. I'm getting grammatical here, but... The first a positive set apart by that comma. This I declare, comma. Hmm. Notice, the author is declaring it for himself. So we also have to declare that for ourselves. You have to declare it. This fact that he is alone is your refuge has to be real to you. It has to be truth to you. Mm -hmm. That's good. This I declare. Amen. And then you're like, well, what are you declaring? That he alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I'm trusting him. Mm. You have to make it personal. That's you have good. to believe that God is actually going to do that for you because you have to believe that he's your refuge. You have to believe that he's your safe haven. So Love faith that. is in two places. It's in your heart, and it's in your mouth. Because we know out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. you got to get it in your heart before you can get it to come out of your mouth. And believe it anyway. You can mm -hmm. say it, and eventually you'll start believing it. But faith has a voice. Faith speaks. Amen. It's hard to stand in faith if you're not speaking out the word. And so I love that he's saying, this I declare. You got to declare it. Make it real to you. And you got to remember the scripture that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Declare out loud that God alone is your refuge and your place of safety. And the more you hear that, because you actually believe your own voice more than any other voice out there. Yeah. The more you declare that, the more you'll start believing it as well. But it is a decision to say this of the Lord and trust him. Absolutely, it's a decision. But have you gotten the revelation that he alone is your refuge? That he alone is your refuge? Have you gotten that revelation? Because you don't want to be putting, in your, putting your faith in something else or someone else as your safe haven. Like, That's do you good. run to your husband as safe haven? Yes, he is one, but he's not the safe haven no. that guards my spirit, you know? Or do you run to your bank account to feel that safety net that you just want to know that you're going to be taken care of? No, money has wings. The Bible talks about that. It can be gone in an instant. So we just have to know that we have to put our, our faith, our trust, our hope, and our well-being in God alone. Um, and he's not an option of refuge. He is the option because he's the only being that can guard your spirit. And nothing can take your salvation away from you. Praise God. Um, but... I wanted to hone in on that word fortress because fortress is a powerful word. When you look at it in ancient historical records, in medieval times specifically, the castle was built on this mound of land and then there was a moat of water around it and that was called their fortress. And why is it called a fortress? Because it only had one entrance and one exit. I don't know if you've seen that. I can think of several movies mm -hmm. where that visual's in my brain, where there's like a huge gate, and then there's guards guarding this one entrance and exit. There's only one way you're getting in, one way you're getting mm -hmm. out. And there's a moat, maybe with alligators. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> it's like not something that you can swim across. So anyway, God and his angel armies are doing that for us. God is saying that he is our fortress. Yeah. He is our safe haven where he and his angel armies are guarding and protecting us. And we can rest in that fortress of God 
and know that there is no enemy getting to us. Mm -hmm. So when you're in that fortress, you can rest knowing that your location and the guards will keep you from all harm. So your guardian angels also. But an example I thought of was um, a baby sleeping in his mom's arms or her mom's arms. Like they're just so comforted and they don't have a care in the world. Like, they're mm -hmm. not thinking about the harm that can come to them because they're just so nestled in and mm -hmm. just sleeping away. Yeah. Um, but do we have that same assurance and confidence that God's got us? Or are you constantly trying to worry about every scenario that could go wrong or how harm could come to you? And that's honestly probably just upsetting to God, mm -hmm. thinking, all right, uh, you think that I can't take care of that for you? And we also know that God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So we have to remember that, that if we're fearful, it's not coming from God. But Psalm 37, verses 39 and 40 is great. It says, The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord, their refuge in a time of distress. The Lord helps and delivers them, he will deliver them from the wicked and will save them because they take refuge in him. So notice it's a conditional statement once again. Yeah. It's like we receive these benefits and promises if we are taking refuge in God. That's if good. we're not taking refuge in God, all the other promises and benefits are null and void. Yeah. So we just want to make that abundantly clear that if you want this protection that is spoken about, so clearly and vividly in Psalm 91, we've got to do what God is saying we are supposed to do, which is a very easy thing when you learn God's goodness and you just develop that personal relationship with him. It's easy to take refuge and just dwell in a shadow. Mm -hmm. But we just want to really make it abundantly clear that all these amazing promises are only valid if we are taking refuge in God and he is truly our Lord and Savior. Yeah. Jesus, Lord of our life, Savior. Yep. So. Yeah, it requires trust. It requires faith. Yep. Which that's exactly what this verse says. And you'll notice, I mean, I'm already noticing we're quoting Psalm a lot, the book of Psalms a lot. Yeah. So um, it's, uh, I have a bunch coming up and I just studied Psalm 119 and I've been reading through the book of Psalms. So uh, you're going to see me quoting a lot of it as well here in a second. So uh, NIV says, verse 2, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Mm -hmm. um, so my God in whom I trust, I want to focus on that. If we truly trust God, then we should delight in obeying his word. It's so interesting to say that. I've read so many scriptures that talk about delighting in, in his words and in his decrees and in his laws and in his commands. And it's like, when I think about rules, when I think about growing up, I did not really delight in my parents' rules. <laughs> I wasn't like, sweet, I get to be home by nine o'clock. Like, <sighs> no, I did not really delight in them. And it's just a whole nother way of renewing your mind, transforming your mind to be like, no, like God made these set these commands, made these rules for a reason. It's not because he's picking on us and he wants us to have FOMO, fear of missing out. No, it's because he cares about us and he doesn't want us to get hurt or hurt others. He's looking out for our best interest and quite honestly, the best interest of others so we don't hurt others. You know, if I kick a ball across the street when I'm three years old, and I just run and get it, I could get hit by a car. So mom and dad would say something like, if you kick the ball across the street, let us know so we can go get it for you or we can go with you to get it. We don't want you to get hit by a car. We have this rule because we love you and we care about you. We don't want to see you get hurt. So moving on here. So I said, if we tr truly trust God, then we should delight in obeying his word. So let's look at some uh, the book of Psalms again. Psalm 119, 18 through 20 says, Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. 
I am a stranger on earth. Do not hide your commands from me. My soul is consumed with longing for your laws at all times. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Like that's, it's like, open my eyes, God, open my eyes so I can see the wonderful things in your law. Yeah. And I mean, I just, that scripture is awesome. It's inspiring to me to like, want to just hunger Crave and it. thirst for the word more and like, okay, why does God, why does God have this as a command? Oh, it makes sense now. Like to, wow, he really cares for me. Um, and in Psalm 119, 47 through 48 says, for I delight in your commands because I love them. I reach out for your commands, which I love, that I may meditate on your decrees. Finally, Psalm 119, 97 through 106, a little bit longer, says, Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands are always with me and make me wiser than my enemies. That's cool. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. I have kept my feet from every evil path so that I might obey your word. I have not departed from your laws, for you, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong path. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. I have taken an oath and confirmed it that I will follow your righteous laws. So our goal as followers of Christ should be to start looking at and loving God's word and God's commands in the way that these verses encourage us to. Those verses, in my personal opinion, are amazing and super encouraging uh, inspiring to me to like really hunger and thirst, as I said before, like as a deer panted for the water, so my soul longeth after you, after your word. So that's another scripture. And that's how you develop that trust that verse two is talking about. Yeah. And there's another verse in Joshua. I think it's one eight, maybe. Um, Meditate in the word day and night, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Yeah. So you can't be prosperous and successful if you are not in the Bible day and night. Yeah. So yeah, you have to anyway. trust his words. I mean, he speaks to us through his word. He gave it to us for a reason. Mm -hmm. So uh, trust that he's given those commands, those laws, decrees, precepts. I haven't heard so many words. I don't know if they all mean the same, or do yeah. you know the difference between all of them? Like, what in the world? But yeah. it's, uh, yeah. Do you trust God and why he wrote those certain things in there? Mm -hmm. Verse 3, for he rescues you from every trap and protects you from the fatal plague. Okay, we're going to take this at face value. From every trap. The enemy is very good at setting traps. I don't know if you've noticed. You probably have quite a bit of life experience up till now about <laughs> traps that he's set for you. Maybe you have fallen into some because you were disobedient. But if you are trying to be obedient to the ways and the will of God, he has a way of giving you a way out. Yep. There's a verse that says that he won't tempt you beyond what yeah, you can handle. Yeah. So there's always a way out. There's always a way of escape. But a lot of times we willingly choose to fall into that trap. Yeah. So I do want you to be aware that he rescues you from every trap, but this is all conditional back to verse one. If we are seeking him, if we are obeying his laws, if we are dwelling in his shadow, meaning right up next to him, listening to him, looking at him, trying to live life how he's telling us to, that's where we get rescued from the trap. If this, then that. Mm -hmm. And I just think of like princesses in the movies and then the prince comes to the rescue, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, maybe that's, that's good. a like good it. example. Yeah. Um, but the second half, he protects you from the fatal plague. Okay. I don't know a time that more than this, that this is more applicable due to COVID going on right now. But the fatal plague, receive that. He protects you from the fatal plague. Just receive that. Just 
take it at face value. It's not like some weird sentence like, does he really mean that? Mm -hmm. Does he really mean like COVID? Mm -hmm. He protects me from COVID? Yeah. Or just like the flu? <laughs> Allergies? Like, no, he says the fatal plague. I think that qualifies. Fatal. So take it at face value and what it means. We're not going to camp on this because we don't want to talk about this, but just take it at face value that that's what it means. God is not taken by surprise by COVID. He's not taken by surprise by any fatal plague that may have crossed this earth in all the thousands of years it's been on here. Um, but just receive that he rescues you and protects you from the fatal plague. So we're going to move on. We're not going to talk about COVID. So. Amen. Um, all right. So verse four says, he will cover you with his feathers and under his wings, you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. Is it rampart? Is that right? Mm -hmm. um, so he will cover you with his feathers and under his wings, you will find refuge. I want to focus on that. This scripture is so beautiful. And it reminds me of a true story that I once read, which I was grateful to be able to find again on a website called backyardchickens.com. Oh my word. Yes, backyardchickens.com. <laughs> oh it's a website about chickens. Okay. Very interesting. Um, so I'm going to read that story to you real quick. It's a true story. Uh, after a forest fire in Yellowstone National Park, forest rangers began their trek up a mountain to assess the inferno's damage. One ranger found a bird literally petrified in ashes, perched statuously on the ground at the base of a tree. Somewhat sickened by the eerie sight, he knocked over the bird with a stick. When he gently struck it, three tiny chicks scurried from under their dead mother's wings. The loving mother, keenly aware of Impending disaster had carried her offspring to the base of the tree and had gathered them under her wings, instinctively knowing that the toxic smoke would rise. She could have flown to safety, but had refused to abandon her babies. Then the blaze had arrived and the heat had scorched her small body. The mother had remained steadfast because she had been willing to die so those under her under the cover of her wings, would live. So this story 100% reminds me of verse 4, because I basically just read yeah. that, taking refuge under uh, God's wings. So God will protect us when we choose to be obedient and take refuge under his wings. Our God is such a good and protective father. The story also reminds me of Jesus, because he chose to give his life on the cross for all of man's sins, even though he could have backed out at any time, even when he was on the cross, he could have just called for the angel armies, come get me off this cross. Mm -hmm. But he went all the way through to protect us from our own sins right. so that we could be forgiven of our sins. So, yeah, that's such a sad story, but such a good story. Yeah. Yeah. Backyard chickens made me laugh. But Backyard chickens <laughs> com. Go check it out. <laughs> oh, my word. I am yeah, not making it up. This is a very powerful verse. Um, and it's well known, too. Psalm 91 is just a very well known chapter. But this verse in particular, like, he'll shield you with his wings, or you'll find refuge under the shelter of his wings, mm -hmm. whichever translation you're used to. But he will shield you with his wings, they will shelter you. His faithful promises are your armor. And the Christian Standard Version reads He will cover you with his feathers. You will take refuge under his wings. His faithfulness will be a protective shield. Mm. I just like that we're so hidden and so covered that the enemy can't even find us or touch us. That's good. And what's really, really cool is something that I learned from a women's Bible study recently is that the feather, the wings have two different types of feathers. So the outer layer of feathers are the stiff feathers, the rough feathers that provide the protection a little more so. But underneath the wings, I don't know if it's all birds or certain birds, but I'm assuming most birds would have this. Underneath the wings are what's called pinion feathers. 
and these are like the soft feathers. So these are, I believe, if I'm correct here, the feathers that you buy in pillows, like down feathers. Mm -hmm. Like they're known for being the soft, fluffy, mm -hmm. comfy feathers. Yeah. Not the rough ones, you know? So I just think that's really cool that it shows that God's protecting you and also comforting you mm. at the same time. Because those soft feathers on the inside are the ones that are going to make you feel like nestled in and, and protected and like safe in your father's arms. Yeah. So I just thought that was a good point to bring up. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Yeah, that reminds me, my, my roommate, Kurt, who you just met, my mm -hmm. old roommate, Kurt, he was a college roommate and <coughs> a roommate at San, in San Diego. <coughs> he had a bird, uh, an African gray, and the one before that was a... Uh, Hackett? Yeah, Hackett. Hackett was his name. Um, so, uh, but yeah, the, the feathers on the outside were more stiff, and I remember watching him clean himself, pr mm. preen or prune or whatever, mm -hmm. and he would, when he would lift his, his wings, you could see underneath those like little soft feathers like mm, you were just talking yeah. about. So, yeah. I mean, hey, at least I know an, an African gray has that. So, I, I mean, I'm assuming most, probably all birds yeah. are, are similar. Yeah. So. Pretty cool. Do you want me to just do verse 5 since you have 5 and 6? Probably? Yeah. Sure. Okay. So verse 5 in the NIV says, You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day. So I want to focus on you will not fear the terror of night. So when God is with, with us, we have no reason to fear. Yeah. Um, we read in Psalm, and I'm usually going to refer to other scriptures and everything that mm -hmm. I do, just so y'all know, and so I'm referring good. to Psalm again. Uh, when we read in Psalm 23, 4 through 6, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. So I'm going to quickly explain that scripture because a lot of people don't really understand that scripture. So you're the rod of God, God's rod. And you have to think of it as a shepherd, a shepherd that is caring for a flock of sheep. He carries a rod and he carries a staff and they both have different purposes. So the rod is to beat off, not, not to beat the sheep. There would be no reason to beat the sheep. So when people try to look at that scripture as, oh, well, when you're in disobedience, God's going to smack you with the rod. Like, no, the rod is to smack the enemy. So when a wolf or a bear come after the sheep that perhaps got a little further away from the flock, because when they're all together, they don't typically, won't typically get attacked. It's always the one that seems to get away, to, that steps outside of that umbrella of protection. Mm -hmm. That's the one that, that, that's going to get attacked. So Usually they'll go after the one that's the furthest away from the flock. Well, the shepherd is there with his rod to beat the wolf or the bear or whatever predator might come in to go after the sheep. Now, the staff, on the other hand, is what they will pull the sheep in with. So that one that got away, it's like, eh, they hook it. You've probably seen Bo Peep with her little, it's like a little hook yeah. thing. They hook the the sheep and pull it in it's like hey get, get over here you're starting to stray away yep. stay with the rest of us so the rod and the staff the rod is protection to beat off the enemy the staff is to pull you in come a little closer it's safer under my protection mm -hmm. so just wanted to explain that <clears throat> another scripture that comes to mind is romans 8 31 through 32. it says what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for, all, for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? So if God is for us, who can be against us? I love that scripture. No one and nothing can defeat God. Amen. The final scripture that comes to mind when I read uh, verse 5 here is 1 John 4.18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. So that's a great scripture 
when you're looking at, you will not fear the terror of night. God's perfect love. Mm -hmm. The only perfect love that exists is God's love. Our love is imperfect. So that, that's why I say God's perfect love casts out all fear. Right. So keep going. Oh yeah. Verse six. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, verse six says, da, 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 da. I'll just read verse five because it goes into verse six. So I'll read five and six. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day. Then verse six, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. So you also don't need to fear the plague that destroys at midday, which we, Jasmine mentioned a little bit on it. I'm not going to hang on it too much, but don't worry or stress yourself for even a moment. Don't be afraid of viruses or sicknesses uh, in general, but rather seek the Lord in prayer as he is Jehovah Rapha, our healer. He is the great physician. We see it all throughout scripture, Jesus healing right and left, God healing right and left in the Old Testament. Isaiah 53, 5 is referring to Jesus when it says, but he, Jesus, was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us to peace. And with his stripes, by his stripes, we are healed. Psalm 107, 119, uh, Psalm 107, 19 and 20 says, Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. He sent out his word. <laughs> It's awesome. There's healing in the word, in mm -hmm. his word. Psalm 103, 2 through 3 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases. Amen. We read in Hebrews, this is the last one, we read in Hebrews 13, 8, that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So his healing is still very much alive and active today when we seek him wholeheartedly in prayer. Yes. Love it. Sweet. The word works. Amen. Word up. Verses five and six. Now you don't need to be afraid of the dark anymore, nor fear the dangers of the day, nor dread the plagues of darkness, nor disasters in the morning. Mm. So what do I hear from these verses? I hear a lot of times of the day. I don't know if you noticed that. The dark, the day, the darkness, the morning, like throughout all of it, you hear in James's translation it said midday. Basically what we hear is we're covered 24-7. Yeah, that's right. Every time of the day, he didn't really leave anything out, morning, noon, and night, but he's telling us to not be afraid. Second Timothy 1 verse 7 says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Amen. That means a mind that's not freaking out, stressing out, fearful, worrying, anxious. No. God gave us power, love, and a sound mind. So if you're fearful, God didn't give that fear to you. Guess who did? Mm -hmm. The devil. Cast him out. Amen. Please. And just like James said, I'm going to pay you back off of it. 1 John 4, 8 says that God is love. Remember that truth because... 1 John 4, 18 says, there is no fear in love. So you could replace that. There is no fear in God. Instead, perfect love, or instead, perfect God, drives out fear because mm -hmm. fear involves punishment. Yeah. So therefore, since God is love, there's no fear in God, and he doesn't cause those fearful feelings or thoughts. You may hear like, Fear God. You might hear that statement. That means have a holy reverential awe of God, that you respect God, that you're in awe of him, you adore him. That doesn't literally mean like be terrified of God because mm -hmm. he wants to be your father as well. Have that holy reverential awe of him because yes, he is a holy judge as well. But we're talking about like the fear that the enemy tries to bring against us. So with all that being said, it's safe to say that fear and love are polar opposites. Oh, yeah. Love and fear cannot coexist. Nope. So. Keep going. Verse 7. Though a thousand fall at my side, though ten thousand are dying around me, the evil will not touch me. 
And once again, you can take this verse at face value with COVID or with the vaccines. Yep. Like we literally do see thousands falling around us. So we can take this at face value. I don't necessarily think that God is using figurative speech here. I think he's literally saying, even if there's thousands of people being affected by these plagues or these attacks of the enemy, it's not going to touch you. Mm -hmm. If you have faith in the word of God, put it to work. But I think of this as like a force field. I'm going to use another movie example, because why not? I'm sure you've seen the movie The Incredibles. Where this family, this amazing cartoonistic family just mm -hmm. has superpowers up the yin yang. <laughs> but Violet, their daughter, has the power of force fields. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you remember those cool scenes. But I think of that when I think of this verse, because though all these other people around you might be getting affected by this evil or this plague or whatever's going on, God puts up that impenetrable force field that nothing can get through to you. And I just think that is so awesome. Mm -hmm. And it says the evil will not touch me. It doesn't say it might not touch me. It says it will not. So that's 100% <coughs> guarantee. So I just want to point that out. Yeah, so all that to say... I mean, that verse can be there and you can just, you know, study it while you watch this video or you can do a more powerful thing. One of the most powerful things you can do is pray the life breathing, life giving, alive and active, sharper than any double edged sword scripture over your life yes. daily. Put it to work. If you don't open this, if you don't speak it out. In the beginning, God spoke, let there be light. God spoke, that there's life in the tongue. There's life in the words that you speak out and that you hear. When you speak it out, you hear it. It comes back to you. So my encouragement to you is not to just get a, a fun, tingly feeling when you study Psalm 91 with us today, but to actually, I would encourage you, it's only 16 verses. Can you pray this scripture over yourself out loud every day? Though, whatever it was, it's not on there anymore. A thousand may fall at this side and whatever on this other side. You know, the whole Psalm 91 is so powerful. And it, as you're in prayer, say, God, I want to pray these scriptures. I am praying these scriptures back over my life reminding you of your promises that come from your word and you are not a God that would lie. So when you're doing that, that is putting that force field that she just talked about. You're praying the force field of Psalm 91 over your life. And if you've read this, it's powerful. Amen. Why not pray the armor of God over yourself as we talked and about in the video the here recently, plead the blood of Jesus over yourself, pray these scriptures over yourself saying, God, I pray Psalm 91 over myself, over my loved ones, over whoever you have to pray it over, yes. and believe it, trust it, have faith. It is truth. So, yeah. And our mentors pray this over themselves every night before they go to bed. And I just love, going back to verse 4, the second half of the verse says, His faithful promises are your armor. Amen. So, these there promises that we find in the Word are our armor. They're what protect us. So let's put them to work. And I'm going to explain how you do that later in this, in this video. Yeah. Um, yeah. Using our angels. So mm. verse 8, you want to go for it? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to take that little moment to just, because you had talked about that. I was mm -hmm. like, well, how do you do this? Pray it over yourself. Yes. Look at it daily. All right, so verse 8. Also, uh, one more thought. Yeah. Get it down in you now so that when you need it, it comes out of your heart. Mm. Yeah. We're like sponges here. What we're yeah. needing to do is just absorb all of this. If we're studying Psalm 91, we're absorbing it, it's getting down in us, then when the pressure of life, when the trials of life come and try to squeeze you, mm -hmm. what's going to come out? What's in the sponge? Yeah. Well, if we apply that to our life, 
when life tries to squeeze us, when the devil tries to squeeze us or get rid of us, what's going to come out when we're getting squeezed? Faith, Psalm 91 scriptures. Mm -hmm. So that's my challenge and something that I'm really working on in my personal life also is getting all of this ammunition of scripture, healing, finances, um, protection, whatever it might be, down in me so I have it before I ever actually need it. Yeah. So I challenge you. You might be like, well, I feel safe in my life right now. <laughs> awesome. That's so awesome. Just make sure that you are learning and getting it ingrained in you so that it's like second nature if you ever get in a situation. I think of one story from my mentor, Pastor Chris, Christine. She used to live in Hawaii, and there was a gal that she would mentor. She'd come over to her house every so often, but she got um, she got jumped by a group of thugs, basically. And she had been told by Pastor Christine to memorize Psalm 91 and say it over her life every day. But when she was in the adrenaline of the moment and she's getting mugged, all she could think of was, um, it was verse two. It's just a precious, no, it's not verse two. It's a precious uh, story. Verse four, she's like, uh, this little girl, she's not little, but she's probably in her young 20s. She's like, he'll cover me with his feathers. Feathers, I pray feathers over me. <laughs> but God honors that. Because yep. she was trying to use the, the verses that she had spoken over her life every day yeah. and you're the situation where she didn't know she was going to get mugged that day but she ended up being perfectly fine she was protected they left without harming her mm -hmm. but i just love that story because it's like feathers she knew feathers. that god was her yeah. her mm -hmm. refuge her protection <laughs> her force field if, if you will yeah so I just always remember that <laughs> you say, feathers. feathers, he covers me with his feathers. <laughs> and so I'm like, amen. Even if that. you just know that, God will honor that. Mm -hmm. Amen. So that was right. just precious. So verse 8, you will, you will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the, of the wicked. That seems weird. The punishment of the wicked, wicked. So you will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. Um, oh, and then it goes on. That's why it seemed weird. Um, I like my translation better. Yeah. What's your translation? I will see how the wicked are punished, but I will not share it. Okay. I like that. All right. So <laughs> I repeat this. You will, ob you will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. So we should take comfort in knowing that when evil is done towards us, whether directly or indirectly, that God has our backs and he will not let those evil deeds go unpunished. We don't have to stress about a plan of revenge or that evil that has been done to us, but rather we go to the Lord in prayer and let him do what he knows best to do in that situation. We fight our battles in prayer and we know that the Lord is faithful and just in all that he does. So, I mean, I, I even think of that song, you know, this is how I fight my battles. Yes. This is how I fight my battles. And it even says, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It talks in Psalm 91 about those angels that, that are around you and how his feathers are around you. And so, um, But there's another we, story in the Bible of how, I don't know who it was, darn it, but they were looking out and they saw the opposing army and they were oh yeah. way outnumbered. They mm -hmm. looked like it's like an obvious defeat. But then God gave him a spiritual revelation of or spiritual discernment of all the angels that were out there mm -hmm. going to fight yep. on his behalf that God had sent, and mm -hmm. they way outnumbered the enemy. So it's it's really cool when you realize that. Yeah, um, I still got more. Okay, keep going. So here are a few scriptures that came to mind when I read verse 8. Proverbs eleven twenty one, Assuredly, the evil man will not go unpunished, but the descendants of the righteous will be delivered. And then Isaiah 3.11. Woe to the wicked. It will go badly with them, for what he deserves will be done to him. Mm, so. Yeah. Verse 8. I will see how the wicked are punished, but I will not share it. Yeah. Wicked gets punished eventually. Mm -hmm. It might seem like they're getting away with it for a while, but 
Mm -mm, God always gets, he's a righteous, holy God. Mm -hmm. People he's, that he's are wicked judge. are not going to get off scot-free. There's consequences. Um, but this verse also goes back to being out from under God's umbrella of protection as well. Mm -hmm. um, Deuteronomy 28, James already referenced this, the blessings and the cursings, like, Go back and read Deuteronomy 28 for yourself. It's powerful. But it completely outlines the consequences of choosing obedience or disobedience. Mm. And since we established in verse 1 that you only receive protection when, when you're dwelling in God, that's why you won't share the punishment of the evil. Mm -hmm. That's why. Yep. Because you are living according to God's word. You're being obedient. You are within the boundaries. Yeah. So that's why you'll see the wicked punished, but you're not going to share it because you're living life the way God wants you to live it. In Psalm 97.10, it says, God loves all who hate evil, and those who love him he keeps safe. Interesting. Those who love him he keeps safe. Mm -hmm. He snatches them from the grip of the wicked. So notice... Here it is again. You've got to love him before you get the benefit of being protected by him. Yeah, so. that's good. All right, verse 9, I just had quick notes. But it, if, if you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord, who is your refuge, and then it stops. It goes into verse 10. But I want to focus on, again, uh, this reminded me of where we started in verse 1. If this, then that. If you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord, who is your refuge, and it goes refuge. Then it goes into ten. But uh, who? Oh, who is my refuge? Keep even going. Lord, who is my refuge? Then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near you, uh, near your tent. So, but to me, it's like it still goes back to the beginning because I look at that as an if this than that. Even back in verse one. Yeah. So. And it it's basically together. saying the same thing. If you make the Most High your dwelling, then in the beginning it says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High. It's the same idea. So mm -hmm. if this, then that. Yeah. And I'll do 9 and 10 together too. Yeah. In I, the did, Christian, I didn't do 10, but I, I'll, I'll talk about it later. In the Christian Standard Bible, it says, Because you've made the Lord my refuge the Most High your dwelling place, no harm will come to you. No plague will come near your tent. Mm -hmm. So this, once again means the following verses are conditional. If you don't make the Lord your dwelling place, then you can't have these promises. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you don't get the benefits of being close to God when you're not actually close to God. Yeah. It doesn't work like that. You can't buy the protection of God. Mm -hmm. You have to earn it. And it's not even that you earn it, but you just receive it. Receive the love that God wants to give you mm -hmm. and the friendship. But since you, I know you do, I know you make the Lord your dwelling place, <laughs> then this is what's promised to you, that no harm will come to you. No plague will come near your tent. Well, most of us don't live in tents these days unless, unless we're going camping or unless you see the homeless, but the tent signifies where you live. Yep. Most of us have apartments, houses. Dwelling place. Yeah. It's your home. Well, let's put that into context. No harm will come to you. No plague will come near your home. Your home can be off limits. Amen. That means the flu, sickness of any kind, weather patterns like tornadoes, whatnot, mm -hmm. insects, COVID, whatever it is. But I, I even look at this verse and I see the foreshadowing of the blood of Jesus. Mm -hmm. In Exodus 12, if you want to look over that story about the Passover, yeah. where they put the blood over the, their doorposts during the Passover, um, the blood of Jesus covers you. Yep. And that makes you off limits to the plague, off limits to the attacks of the enemy. You're covered by the blood of Jesus, and that is impenetrable. Yep. Yeah, and then I, I didn't read my notes on verse 10, but I just said the enemy may try to bring harm or disaster your way, but God will protect you and no disaster will come near you. She basically just said that. Uh, and this also made me think of John 10, 10. The thief, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And then Jesus, he has come that they may have life and have it to the full. So 
Yep. All right. Verses 11 and 12 in the Christian Standard Bible. For he will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you in all your ways. They will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. These guardian angels are your security guards 24-7. It's like you have personal bodyguards. You have a security mm. team. Amen. So um, Hebrews 1.14 is good food for thought, though. That verse says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve those who are going to inherit salvation? To me, when I read that, that implies that God doesn't send his angels around every human being but only those who will inherit salvation, mm -hmm. which is very interesting. But God knows our whole life beginning to end because he's God. He knows the choices we're going to make. So don't try to comprehend that. Yep. Can't really comprehend that because we're not God. If we could comprehend that, that would mean we're God. So <laughs> anyway, just receive Jesus. We're going to yep. make it simple. Yep. Receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior then you will know for sure that you have a security team of guardian angels on your behalf. And if you want to know how to do that, watch our video. Why Jesus? That's right. Why Jesus? And yeah. you'll learn all about how to receive Jesus, the whole process and how to receive him and why yeah. we chose Jesus Amen. and why you should choose Jesus. <laughs> yes. So if you're concerned about not knowing if you have angels with you, just receive Jesus. Then you Amen. don't have to worry about that. Amen. Psalm 103, verse 20, in the King James Version, it says, Bless the Lord, you, who a you his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commands, hearkening unto the voice of his word. So this is how the angels work. Number one, I'm glad they're strong. I don't know if you noticed in that verse, it says that they excel in strength. I'm glad that we don't have a band of wimpy angels on yeah, our behalf. <laughs> yeah. um, number two, the point I wanted to make is that they hearken under the voice of his word. What does that mean? Normally we don't say the word hearken. It means that they are waiting to hear the word of God spoken out so that they have something to act on. It's like their legal access to be able to go into action. If that makes sense. So Jesus gave us his authority through his blood and through his word. We know that. That's obvious. But Isaiah 55, 11 in the NIV says, So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Notice God even spoke words. We see mm -hmm. that at the beginning of creation. Um, but if God needed to speak words, how much more do we need to? Yep. But the angels just wait while we're quiet. Or they wait when we are speaking doubt, fear, death, confusion, they don't understand that language. They only understand the language of faith. Yep. The only thing they understand is the word of God. Yep. So when we're sitting here speaking the problem instead of confessing the promises, they're going to be rendered inactive. They can't do anything because like we saw in Psalm 103 verse 20, they hearken unto the voice of his word. Mm. If they're not hearing the word, they're not hearkening, meaning they're sitting there twiddling their thumbs, wondering why you keep replaying the problem instead of forecasting the future. Speak out the word as to what you want your life to look like or what promises you want active in your future. Um, so I just thought that that's very important to know and we have to use the word. We have to speak the word out. And yeah. they only understand the word, which is the language of faith. And so use the word to be able to dispatch them for your service or for a specific assignment that you're needing them to do by yeah. using the word. Um, this story is so powerful. It talks about the angels. So there's a pastor on the other side of the, of the world. Um, we, talked about this in our ladies Bible study, but basically there was a church that this pastor was overseeing and they also had a hospital. And it was in an area where witch doctors were extremely prevalent. Um, these witch doctors, a, a group of them showed up with intent to kill everyone in the church 
and the hospital and then burn everything down. That was their goal. Well, this pastor gets alerted by his staff running in saying that there's a lineup of witch doctors outside. But then another staff member comes in saying that they're all laying prostrate on the ground, face down, in a line. It's like a line was drawn. And so he walks out just wondering what's going on because they're like frozen face down on the ground, can't really move. So the pastor goes up to one of them and lays his hand on one and, and this one man gets up shaking saying, your men were so big. Your men were so big. Mm -hmm. And he's just shaking. All of them are, the rest of them are still laying face down. But his pa the pastor was like wondering what men he was talking about. And then, of course, being a pastor, he's like, oh, of course, it's mm -hmm. the angel armies that came to rescue my church, my people, this hospital from murder. Mm -hmm. And so the pastor goes down the line of these witch doctors, lays his hands on each one, and they all receive Jesus. Amen. What a cool turnaround to this story. But awesome. I just think that's so cool that they legitimately were stopped in their tracks mm -hmm. by the angel armies yep. and that they were so big. I know several people who have the gift of spiritual discernment who can see angels and demons. I don't yeah. know that I'd want that gift, but they can see the angels. That's pretty cool. And they're like massive, 10 foot. Yeah. So um, one more story, there's a pastor in Nebraska that I personally know, and he was outside in the parking lot with a youth group when he was first starting out in his ministry, and then there was a, the assistant youth group pastor with him too, but there was a group of blacked out tinted windowed SUVs that rolled up into the parking lot, and you could tell that they were up to no good, and the other assistant, the other assistant with the pastor, was rushing the, the youth kids indoors. But this pastor proceeded to pray in tongues as these people were rolling up in their SUVs and getting out of their cars, obviously with malicious intent. But this pastor stood his ground and started praying in tongues. Then this group of people started looking up, getting white in the face, looking terrified, and they got back in their cars and they sped off out of that parking lot as fast as they could. Mm. Well, what'd they see? Angels. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's just really, really amazing, and I hope that those stories build your faith. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, I'm going to read 11 through 12. I have real quick. Oh, I wanted to say one thing. Uh, I liked what you are saying about, you know, the angels only understand you know, when you're speaking the word of God, when you're speaking positive, when you're speaking, when you're a negative Nancy or negative whatever, I don't want to single out the Nancys, but. <laughs> my mom you, is yeah, Nancy. Yeah. She's what, not negative. That's right. When you're, when you're negative, the angels don't understand. It's like you're speaking a totally different language. And um, so they, they speak the, you know, like the Bible, the word in Proverbs says the tongue has the power of life and death. So when you're speaking life, they can understand that. Mm -hmm. And the word is life. And when you're speaking death, they're like, like you said, right. twiddling their thumbs. So it reminded me of, I go to get my hair cut at this place called Unique Cuts. And all the guys cutting hair in there are from like Chile. 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 So he speaks a little bit of English. The guy that cuts my hair, his name is Christian, which is cool. And so I'll kind of understand him. But then there's a girl in there that's also from Chile. And she speaks English and, and Spanish. Um, and so she'll sometimes translate or whatever, you know, so because he won't be able to understand something I say or whatever. But then I'll hear him talking to other barbers. He and I might have a little bit of a conversation, but then he starts speaking in Spanish to some other barber. And I'm just like, okay, I have no idea what's going on. So like, I'm like the one twiddling my thumbs because I have no idea. I took a little bit of Spanish, but... <laughs> It just reminded me of like, oh, that sounds it's like totally me right. when I go get my hair cut. I'm like, okay. Or he'll be on his phone speaking in right. Spanish. And I'm like, I got no idea. So I could pick up little words, but only because I took some Spanish. But That's a great application point. Yeah. So uh, I'll read in the NIV real quick, verse 11 and 12. Uh, For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. 
Quick, quick notes here, quick paragraph. The power of these verses is simply amazing. God will command his angels to guard us and not even allow us to stub our toes. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that really says that the enemy is already defeated in any attack he would try to bring our way. It's awesome to think that in our obedience, God's angels, uh, God's angels, um, I don't know what I'm saying here, will we'll always protect us, I'll say. I would think that if the enemy came to attack us, that he would quickly shriek and back away in fear when he sees these powerhouse angels, just as she talked about in some of her stories. And um, I mean, I, I remember a, a guy that was on a mission trip, goes on a lot of mission trips, and, and uh, I think that it was said that some people were going to come and take them out in the house that they lived in. I don't remember the real major part of the story, but he got up on his rooftop uh, where he was and just began to pray. And God just said, open your eyes. And so he's up on the roof and he opens his eyes and he looks over and he sees a massive angel on the corner of his rooftop. And then he's like, look the other way. He looks over and there's another massive angel on the other corner That's of the right. rooftop. It just gives me goosebumps to That's think so about. Cool. But basically he was like, I got nothing to fear. I'm good. I'm going to go in and go to bed. Like these things are going to protect me. So it's when we remember that everything's spiritual warfare, when you see in that spiritual realm and you see the massive angels on your side, you got nothing to fear. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. So we're at verse... We're almost there, y'all. 13? Yep. Great. You can safely meet a lion or step on poisonous snakes. Yes, even trample them beneath your feet. Amen. I believe this means we have authority over the devil and his schemes. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's any coincidence, in my opinion, that the two animals mentioned are lions and snakes. Because those are the two animals that the devil's referenced as in the Bible. Yep. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be alert, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That verse doesn't say he is a lion, and it just says he's acting like one, mm -hmm. like he's putting on a show like he is a lion, having those characteristics. Yep. But of course, in the Garden of Eden, we know that Satan appeared as a serpent. So, there we mm -hmm. go. The devil will still try these attacks on you, but you have the authority through Jesus. Amen. We have to enforce our faith with our faith-filled words. Yeah. And the devil is an outlaw. He'll keep running around trying to take territory until he's stopped. So don't let him wreak havoc on your life. Amen. NIV, I think, was pretty much the same, but verse 13 says, You will tread upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. So... Our victory over the enemy, the lion and cobra or servant, or serpent, sorry, is not just, it's not because of our strength and power, but rather our victory in Jesus. Mm -hmm. Here are a few scriptures that back me up on this. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans, Romans 8, 37 says, No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him, Jesus, who loved us. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him, Jesus, who gives me strength. Deuteronomy 24, for the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you the victory. So, Yeah. Verse 14 in the Christian Standard Version, because he has set his heart on me, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. Conditional promise, once again, if you don't love and serve God, then this promise doesn't apply to you. But having your heart set on God means you are loving and valuing him. So just realize because you've set your heart on God, he will deliver you. Yeah. He will protect you because you know his name. That means you trust him, you know his character, you spend time with him. That's what that means. You keep going or whatever, I have 14 and 15. All right. Verse 15 in the Christian Standard Version, When he calls out to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and give him honor. Notice all of these I wills. Mm -hmm. It's not I mights. Yeah. He will, he will, he will, he will. That's a lot of wills. God's not a liar. We've talked about this. Hebrews 6.18 says, 
so that through two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to seize the hope set before us. That's important to know that God's not a liar. So when he's saying, I will answer him, I will be with him in trouble, I will rescue him and give him honor, mm-hmm. take him at his word. He yep. is not a liar. But notice that God is waiting for us to call upon him. He wants us to initiate. Yeah. And we have the very easy part. God, help me. That's our part. When he calls out to me, I'll answer him. That's our part. Calling out to God. So kids, for, for lack of a better word, bug their parents because they are dependent and need their parents. Mm-hmm. Now, we never bug God. Hear me on that. Nope. But we should also be dependent on God. Keep calling out to God. Keep turning to God. Keep yep. asking Him. Keep seeking Him. Why? Because we should be dependent on God. Yeah. And we should be doing... We should never get to the point where we're so independent of God and we're so spiritually mature that we don't need God. No. If we're doing things right, we should become more and more dependent on God because mm-hmm. that means we're putting our faith in Him more deeply. So anyway, that's what I got for that. All right, verses 14 and 15 in the NIV. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. So the Lord rescues us, protects us, answers us when we call on him and honors us because we love him. Again, to put this into a worldly perspective, we can let somebody know that we love them by telling them, but quite honestly, actions speak louder than words. If we truly love someone, we will not only tell them, but we will show them through our actions. Growing up, I was constantly telling my parents that I loved them. Any any phone call, anytime we'd separate, love you. Um, Because... Uh, I would constantly tell, uh, uh, sorry, uh, growing up I was constantly telling my parents that I loved them, but sometimes my actions didn't show them that I loved them because I didn't always honor their authority and follow their rules. One way that we show God that we truly love him is by honoring his authority and walking in his ways, being obedient, by following what his word tells us to do. I love that in verse 15, the Lord says, I will deliver him and honor him. Mm. Wow. The Lord is saying that he will honor us. How much more should we be honoring him and doing all that we can do to make him proud? Amen. So in verse 16, I'm going to let Jazz take because we already talked a little bit about it. And one of us is going to take that one. (laughs) All right. Verse 16. I will satisfy him with a long life and show him my salvation. What a great promise. This means that we will get to live out the fullness of what he has provided for us in salvation. We'll be flourishing and the enemy doesn't get to cut our life short. That's pretty amazing. Genesis 6 verse 3 says, And the Lord said, My spirit will not remain with mankind forever because they're corrupt. Their days will be 120 years. So... I will preface this that some believe that that means it took 120 years for the flood to come and that and for mankind to get wiped out by the flood that that's like a warning of a countdown of how much time they have left on the earth but on the flip side and i lean more towards this upcoming one others believe that we have 120 years to live and that we can stand on that promise so when we come to genesis 25 verse 7 we discover that Abraham lived 175 years. This is after the flood, okay? Isaac lived 180 years. We see that in Genesis 35, 38. And Jacob lived 147 years. We see that in Genesis 47, 28. When we reach Moses, the life expectancy was about 120 years. And we see that in Deuteronomy 34, 7. Numbers 33, 39, and Judges 2, verse 8. So when we're looking at main names in their lifespans, Moses died at exactly 120 years old. Aaron, Moses' brother, died at 123 years old. 
and Joshua died at 110 years old. So I say all of that because Psalms 90 verse 10 mentions that 70 or 80 years as the lifespan, but tons of people live past 70 or 80 years old. Mm -hmm. That's obvious. I mean, my grandpa is 92 right now, and his dad lived to 100. So, I mean, it's so common to live past 70 or 80. Mm -hmm. So, when Psalms 90 verse 10, it says this, Our lives last 70 years, or if we are strong, 80 years. Even the best of them are struggle and sorrow. Indeed, they pass quickly and we fly away. All right, so when you read Psalm 90 verse 10 and then you read Genesis 6 verse 3 about living 120 years, you're like, okay, which one's right? Psalm 90 is a prayer of Moses. It was written by a godly man who lived to the age of 120 years old. Moses lived 120. You can see that in Deuteronomy 34 verse 7. This is important information that helps us understand that Psalm 90 verse 10 is not referring to the maximum number of years that men and women will live. Because if that was the case, why have all these people lived past 80 years old? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Moses knew that some men and women lived past 70 or 80 years when he wrote the Psalm. He himself lived to 120 years old. The key phrase is the years of our life. It refers to an average. Mm -hmm. So in this case, 70 years. 80 years is possible in this average if the individual is physically strong and healthy. But longer years are absolutely attainable, just as Moses experienced as he himself lived to 120. But today, some, some people, I think the oldest woman is One, even past this. It's 123, I think. Yeah. There's a lady who lived past the age of 120, but it's also documented that a ton of men have lived over 100 years old. So it's not unheard of for people to live longer than 80 years. Psalm 90 verse 10 is not trying to give us a maximum limit on the age that a man or a woman can live. It is instead referring to the average lifespan of mankind. And I was curious for myself, so I, I searched uh, what the average lifespan is in the world today. And the average life expectancy is 72.5 years old. So, with that being said, that fact, that research, that current statistic agrees with Moses' statement in Psalm 90 verse 10 that says that the years of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength 80. So, that means the average. Okay, well that yep. makes sense. Doesn't mean that you have to die by 80. Because mm -mm. mm -mm. I, I lean towards the 120. 120. Like, I believe that God meant we can live to 120. Yep. So I'm going to claim 120 years, absolutely. But you're like, okay, Jazz, really? You want to live to 120? Got a lot to do. Okay. I got two scriptures for you that I'm going to read that's going to completely change your perspective. Because mm -hmm. you don't have to live to 120 years old and be a vegetable and feeble. Uh-uh. Listen to this. Just listen to this. This is so awesome. Joshua 14, verses 10 through 12. This is Joshua speaking. And he and Caleb are the ones who went into the promised land, said we can take it, and the rest of the ten were fearful. So mm -hmm. that's who this is. As you see, the Lord has kept me alive these 45 years as he promised, since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel was journeying in the wilderness. Here I am today, 85 years old, I am still as strong today as I was the day Moses sent me out. My strength for battle and for daily tasks is as it was then. Now give me this hill country the Lord promised me on that day because you heard them then that the Anakim are there as well as long, large fortified cities. Perhaps the Lord will be with me and I'll drive them out as the Lord promised. So here Joshua is 85 years old. Mm -hmm. saying he is just as strong now as he was 45 years ago at 40, 40 years old. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to put this in perspective. James mm -hmm. is 41 currently. Yeah. So you can look at James, his strength, mm -hmm. his fitness. Yeah, baby, you're yeah, fit. Yeah, yeah. 
and his quality of life. And according to these verses, <coughs> James would have the same strength for battle and for daily tasks at 85 years old as he currently does now at 40. Mm -hmm. 41, technically, yeah. but amen. Amen. I mean, strength for battle, that is physical exertion mm -hmm. and daily tasks. I receive that. Amen. Now listen to this, Deuteronomy 34, 7. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not weak and his vitality had not left him. Mm -hmm. To me, that means he lived his 120 years full out. Healthy. Healthy. Nothing hindering him, nothing holding him back. Mm -hmm. And I just, I received those verses. Like, yep. You do not have to be old and feeble. Who said that? Mm -hmm. Stand on the promises of the word, please. Amen. Stand in faith. It's promised to you, so receive it by faith because we know from the word that God is no respecter of persons. Just because he did it for Joshua and Moses doesn't mean he's not going to do it for you. Yeah. That means he will do it for you because he's not a respecter of persons. Yeah. But obviously, common sense wise, there is a God part and a man part to living 120 years. We're not going to be ignorant here. If you eat junk food all the time, never take your vitamins, and never work out, then you have no business claiming that you're going to live to 120 years old. Okay? Mm -hmm. We got to be smart. We got to be proactive. But if you're doing what you can by being smart, eating clean, working out, taking vitamins, getting proper sleep, not abusing substances, like if you're doing that, you're doing your part, then yeah. expect God to do his part. Amen. And I really do believe that there are 120 year anointings that need to come to fruition. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by that? Think how much more wisdom and knowledge about God that you have now compared yep. to 10 or 20 years ago. Now try to think future oriented and think how much wisdom and knowledge about God you would have at 120 years old yep. compared to now. Don't you think that there's lessons about faith and about life that 120 year olds need to be sharing with people that are in their 20s and 30s and how much better off people's in their 20s, 30s, 40s would be mm -hmm. having that wisdom and those stories and those um, testimonies of God's faithfulness? Amen. Amen. So we need to start claiming that 120 and standing on that and just not saying, I'm going to die early. No, don't even claim the 70 or 80 in yeah. Psalm 90 verse 10. And I've heard from several people that that was written when they were wandering in the wilderness in disobedience. And that could also be a factor of why 70 or 80 is the average when you're out of the dis when you're out of obedience will, yeah. and out of the will of God makes sense why your life would be cut short more. Yeah. So anyway, I hope this encourages you to even look into these scriptures more for yourself. And when you start meditating on them, you'll be like, yeah, mm -hmm. why not? Because there's people in the Bible that lived to 900 years old. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously different circumstances back then with oxygen levels, as yeah. we find from Kent Hovind, yeah. Dr. Kent Hovind. Creation science evangelist. Yeah. He's great. But anyway. No, and it just, again... The tongue has the power of life and death. Yeah. So if you're speaking, I'm going to die early, guess what? You're going to die early. Mm -hmm. You're speaking it out. You're, you're putting life to that by speaking right. the death over, over, over yourself. I have two friends that didn't li live to see 40 years old because, and they were in fitness. They were fit. They didn't live to see 40 years old because they kept, they kept saying, both of them, I just really just think I'm, I'm not going to live a full life. I'm going to die. I'm going to die young. I'm going to, I'm going to die early. So you know? sad. And both of them very super, super fit, top fitness model mm -hmm. guys did not live to see 40. I'm older than they were and they were older than me when they passed. Yeah. But, or, well, they, they, they were both older than me period, but they never saw 40. And it's like mm -hmm. my attitudes, what I speak is I'm going to live till I'm 120 and I'm going to feel great even at that age be healthy at that age. Not so, even wishful thinking. There's yeah. scriptural references yep. for that. 
So, yeah. So we encourage you to speak life. You got a lot of living to do. A lot so, to accomplish lot for the to, kingdom. Exactly. So. All right, let's wrap this up. Yep. So uh, hopefully uh, you enjoyed today's video. If you did, be do us a huge favor, share it on your social media. We want to get the word of God out to as many people as possible. The good news of the gospel, the awesome news that comes from Psalm 91. We want people to read this and grow in their walk with God and their walk with Christ Jesus. So get that out there. Help us get the word, the good news of the gospel out there to others by sharing it on your social media. Um, copy it, copy the link, share it to friends in a text, um, and just encourage them through, through this with the word of God. Um, and beyond that, uh, we'd love to hear what you thought of this. So do us a huge favor, drop us a comment on social media, whether that's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. I'll talk about those links a little bit later, but share with us what you thought of it, what you took from it, what yeah. you got on your own as you read it. We'd love to hear that. Um, we do not just film spiritual videos. Um, I will talk a little bit more about them though, but when you go to jamesandjazz.com, you're going to click on that videos tab and it's going to scroll you to three different sections of videos. The first one is spiritual videos. That's what we did here. Today was more of a topical, I guess. Uh, we did focus on Psalm 91, so Bible study it, we're, special we're a little edition. bit confused with what this one was going to be called, but topical focusing on Psalm 91. But we also do other topical stuff that we've done in the past where people ask us questions. Will you do a topical video on this, like the Trinity, or uh, the fruits of the Spirit, or what is love, or the armor of God, or all kinds of different stuff that people will request, and we'll do a topical video on that and pull in Scripture to talk about those, what the Bible says about those. We also do Bible study with us. We've done the whole book of James, the book of John, the book of Philippians. We're about to go into Galatians. We're going to keep working our way through the New Testament. The Bible study with us stuff is a lot of fun. We do one chapter per video, and we really break it down and pull the meat out of it. And then also, our second section of videos is physically fit videos. Um, those are uh, we do workouts, full length workouts, body part specific workouts with dumbbells, with resistance bands. We've done some stuff with kettlebells. Uh, we're starting to do stuff with circular bands, resistance bands, uh, resistance bands in general. We've done cardio in place, uh, a lot of full length workouts that you can find there. And we also have instructional videos where we'll do all the similar stuff, but we don't have it as a 20, 30, 45 minute long workout. It's instructional videos. We'll show you the exercise that you can do, body part specific, uh, with dumbbells, with resistance bands, with kettlebells, with the, the circular round bands. So I encourage you to check those out, take some screenshots, uh, take some notes, do those workouts on your own. And then beyond that, our third uh, section is life and relationship videos. The life section is really just us trying to help you to get to know us better, uh, some monumental moments in our lives, some stuff with weddings, with vacations, all kinds of fun stuff, our cat, to help you to get to know us and our personalities better. And then the relationship side of that is us helping you to have healthy relationships. A lot of times we'll, we'll get requests on what to film under that category as well. So check those out. think you'll really enjoy those. And finally, um, if you want to be in the know of what's going on with James and Jazz, when we're putting up videos, things like that, that's where you can follow us on social media. We're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. So you want to follow us, like us, subscribe to our YouTube. You will find those links when you go to jamesandjazz.com. You'll see those uh, little social media icons at the top and the bottom of the page. Yeah, if you scroll to the bottom of our website, jamesandjazz.com, you'll see where you can subscribe to our email list. And then right next to that is how you can book us to speak at an mm -hmm. event. So whether it's at your church, a conference, a school, whatever it is, let us know and we'll get back to you. At the top of our website, you will see the donate tab. First of all, thank you for partnering with us in prayer. Yeah. And secondly, we just wanted to give you an opportunity to sow financially into James and Jazz. Obviously no pressure or obligation because we give all these videos to you for free. Yeah. Um, but if you are like, you know what, James, you know what, Jazz, like these videos have really helped me. I just really would love to bless you with $10. Thank you so much because we'd love to do this full time and it takes a lot of time to do this and we have bills like normal people. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. Um, and right next to that tab is the courses tab for all my Christian ladies out there. Check that out. All right. Thank you all so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you back at jamesandjazz.com for those physical, spiritual, and relational needs. All right, take her easy, y'all.